Well, listen, if you have your Bible, we're going to be in two places today. One will be John chapter 3, we'll be in verse 16, but we'll also begin in Hebrews chapter 1 as we continue to look at what it means to consider Christmas. Um, And today what we're talking about is considering the role of Jesus. And as we do that, we'll be taking the Lord's Supper together uh, as a part of our time of worship. Uh, As I was preparing for today, I I really found myself uh, looking back to a quote actually by Aristotle. Uh, And and what Aristotle said was, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. The whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that got me thinking, uh, do you you live by event or by calendar? For instance, I, I tend to look forward to Christmas. And when Christmas is over, I tend to start gearing up for New Year's. And when New Year's is over, I start gearing up for Valentine's Day. And when Valentine's is over, I start gearing up for, Chris, for, for Easter. And when Easter's over, I start gearing up for my birthday. <laughs> when my birthday's over, I look forward to next birthday. You're right. So I just, is he, anyone else, you can give me a little like confession moment. Anyone else do something like that? And thanks for making me think I'm not as, you know, out there. It's, I just live moment to moment. And sometimes, because I'm living from moment to moment or looking forward to this and that and the other, sometimes I miss the bigger picture of a year. And, and, and there are some years, if I look back in my past, that I will tell you that was an amazing year in my life. And there are other pictures that I would say, I'm so glad that year is behind me. But, but throughout my, my goings and comings, I tend to find myself looking at the parts instead of the whole. And I started to think about that at Christmas time, right? As we look at Jesus, when you sing about Jesus at Christmas, does he automatically become a baby again? Do you do this to him? Like, do you just visualize this all of a sudden, right? I, I think sometimes we can look at the part instead of the whole. And when I found myself in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it told me to consider Jesus differently. Look in your Bible, uh, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Therefore, holy brothers, who share in a heavenly calling. Remember last week, we talked about that. It says, listen. Consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. And what David talked about in children's time was such a beautiful reimagining, a remembering of that. That God has called us not simply to think of Christmas, but to think about the whole of who Jesus is and was. As we think even to uh, taking the Lord's Supper or to Easter, the resurrection, as we sing Joy of the World, we're thinking not back in time, but we're thinking for eternity as it comes. As we talk about hope, we know that hope came that day in a way that it could never have been conceived, but that hope isn't a memory to be registered and accessed at certain dates, but that hope is what we live in, will one day live in, fully. And so today, as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper, I want you to know we need to understand the parts of Christ's role so that it will help us delight in the whole of his coming. We need to understand the parts of Christ's role so that we can understand the whole of his coming. We want to see the big picture That Jesus came as the hope of the world, but the reason we know he was the hope of the world is because we looked at the whole of who God revealed himself to us through him. And we we can't fake it. You know, sometimes we read passages and we say, Jesus, he's the apostle and the high high priest of my confession. I've never seen a t-shirt that said that. But those are good words that I use all the time and and that we hear in church. But we need to make sure that we really understand that part of of the whole of Jesus Christ. And here's why we, we must understand it. Because if we don't, we will miss something and there's a lot on the line. I was at a mission trip um, 15 years ago or so, uh, maybe more. And, And we were working on a roof in Hattiesburg, Mississippi in the afternoon. And it is hot. And, and we are having to replace some rafters in this roof because it had fallen apart. And, and uh, we realized we had cut one too short. 
And I remember a crew chief uh, looking around, and there was a young man there who knew everything. At like 16, he knew, like sincerely, he knew it all. He should have been president, you know, CEO and all at the same time. He knew everything. And it's amazing how his IQ went up when the girls were around. You know what I mean? You, you feeling me a little bit here? And so we're up there, and he goes, we go, oh, we cut it short. And he kind of smiles, and he looks at this young man who knew everything, and he said, hey, listen, I think I have a board stretcher in my truck. Do you know what that is? This young man said, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. <laughs> he said, yeah, you know what it looks like? Oh, yeah, I would know it if I saw it. Okay, would you just go look and see if I remember to bring one with me? And he goes down. And about five minutes later, I'm gonna, oh, we're all picturing what he's doing. He comes back up to the top of the roof. He says, oh, I think you left it at home. And this was a gracious older man. And he said, yeah, maybe I did. Now, for some of you who are not constructionally inclined, there is no invention that stretches boards, right? It's a brilliant idea. But there's no such thing. This young man said, I know what a board is, and I know what stretching looks like. That makes sense to me. If we could just eat that wood a little bit longer, you would never have to recut again. It's beautiful. He was familiar with the parts, but that didn't make him understand the whole. Are you following me? Have you ever been that young man with Jesus? Oh, I, I know the parts, God. You know, I'm, uh, I, I, I got this. And Jesus is saying, you know, no, 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 I want you to stand the whole of me. And we've got to jump in and understand what that looks like as we jump into that. So look, look at this with me. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1 says, Consider Jesus the apostle, the high priest of our confession. So let's just, let's just run through this. As we talk about what the word apostle, high priest, and what the word confession means. The word apostle means an authorized agent to, that has been dispatched for or with something. It's actually a nautical term is really what it is. It, before we saw it in the New Testament, it was just a nautical term in Greek life. And so when ships would be dispatched with a cargo... The, the boats around the ship, right, and the thing here, that would be, right, they would be going as an apostle, right? They would be carrying, dispatched on a mission, carrying either a message or an item with them. That was what it meant. It was, it was what was and who was sent out and dispatched by someone on the open seas. Now, in the New Testament, Jesus grabs hold of that, and he makes it bigger. And we see that an apostle, still the same understanding, is one who has been dispatched with, or in Jesus' case, as the message. An authorized agent to act on behalf of the one who sent him. That's what it means to be a, an apostle. One who has been dispatched and in church by God himself. The high priest, this picture of a high priest, when it says that consider Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. The high priest, if we just take these words apart, just simply means the highest authorized priest in a place or in a group of worship. But in the Old Testament, God gave his people such a deeper meaning of that because the high priest had a job. His role was to be mediator between God and his people. That was what the high priest did. He went into, right, the, the Holy of Holies. He went into that area and he prayed on behalf. When, when we see these pictures of the tabernacle, the high priest was the go-between in a relationship between God and God. And men and his people. But he was also in charge of making sure the people understood what it took for a right relationship with God. 
We know that to be some of the law of the Old Testament. We know that to be some of the, the traditions, the festivals it is. He was responsible, the high priest, to make sure that the covenant was enforced. He was in charge of making sure the covenant was enforced. The high priest was a symbol of God's grace who made sure a relationship worked and that people knew what it meant to stay in relationship with him. The word confession is just an admission of personal need. Now it's different than profession, right? A, a profession is when you and I exclaim to others about something that has occurred. A confession is when you proclaim to yourself, so to speak. It's when you confess before God, when you confess this need or belief in a personal, relational way with God. And our highest confession in the church is Jesus Christ as Lord. It's our highest confession anywhere. And so I, I wanted to, to get this so you would know how the Lord's Supper and how John 3, 16 and whatnot follow and fit in this beautiful passage that said, consider Jesus the one who was dispatched by God as the message and the messenger who is in charge of keeping our relationship with God in line, and by his grace, he is in charge of enforcing the covenant. And this is true of those who will confess it. It's true of those who won't, but since they haven't owned it, if you haven't owned it yet, it's not for you yet, so to speak. It's waiting Jesus still is the high priest. Jesus still is the apostle, the great apostle of God, the son of God. But our life, our relationship stands upon our confession, admission, our need, our belief that he is so. Consider Jesus. The one dispatched from God to earth in the form of a babe as an apostle. How do I know that that was God's intent? John chapter 3, verse 16. You can read it with me. It's good stuff. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Jesus is the apostle of our confession. Go to verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order the world might be saved through him. In this passage, we see that Jesus, this is your, if you're filling the blanker, Jesus is sent as, from God as and with the good news that I now receive and confess. That's what we consider Jesus as the apostle of our confession. When we consider Jesus in these great big words, this, this amazing depth of God's richness here, what it means is, is that you and I are to constantly in our heart understand that Jesus is sent from God as and with the good news. And that it is I who have received this good news. And because I am his, I confess it. That's what the Bible says. And, and God gives us this beautiful picture. In John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave. The word gave is this picture of a gift. It is saying that, that God gave his son. He ditched past his own son. Why? Because he loved the sinful, fallen, broken, messed up, divorce-ridden, angry, life-destroyed world so much that he chose to dispatch his apostle, his son, with and as the good news from heaven that we can confess and know because of Christmas. You see, God the creator gifted Jesus to his mission 
and to us. We are the recipients of his gift. But he never belonged to us. He's always belonged to God's purpose, his plan, the one who sent him. You see, there's a difference when we understand Jesus as the apostle, our Savior and Lord, our groom. We belong to him. You see, because there's no possession that gets transferred. God didn't say, here's my son. I'm going to kick him down to earth. I hope this works out. And someone was smart enough to own Jesus and make him work towards his good pleasure. You follow me? The apostle understanding and considering Jesus as our apostle means that God gave out of grace his son to be the method and the messenger of good news. And it was sourced in the love of God. How could God give his son this way? I want you to consider Jesus. If God sent his son because your life and my life was so messed up, and our imperfection was the source of his coming. Then when you were perfect, would you need him anymore? Consider Jesus. If, if Jesus was sent as a reaction from the Lord Most High to the unbelievable, he never thought of it sin of this world. If that was why God sent his son, then not only is the reason for God sending him imperfect, but it leads us to a, a perfect destination that is only realized when we say it's realized. But God, in his wisdom and his grace, didn't send Jesus because you were so messed up. He didn't send Jesus because I was so rebellious. Consider this, God sent Jesus because he loves you and he wants you to be in relationship with him. And that's why just sending him as apostle is, is not enough. And I want you to know this, Hebrews 3, 1, it's beautiful. You don't want to just simply consider Jesus as the apostle but we need to know when heaven came down on the glorious night that Christ was born, we also received our high priest of our confession. Why does that matter? Because Jesus didn't just carry the good news. He wasn't just the good news. The good news is, as high priest, he is in charge of making sure that you and I can have a relationship with God. And he is in charge of protecting the covenant that guards your salvation every day, no matter what you did last night on your way to church or what's gone through your mind. Now, Jesus didn't come so that we could live in sin. He came so that we could have a right relationship with us. And as high priest, he goes before God. He keeps us in relationship. And as the garter of the covenant, as the garter of the covenant, it's his job to oversee. You and I know the way. Not just before we know Christ, but as we walk with him. The Bible says the Lord disciplines those he loves. Guess who's in charge of discipline? of his children, Jesus. Now this is a different discipline than we read about. Look in verse 17. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Verse 18, Who, whoever believes in him isn't condemned, but whoever does not believe, they're condemned already because they did not believe in the name of the son of God. And this is judgment. The light came into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and he doesn't come into the light. Lest the works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Knowing Jesus as our high priest of our confession is this. 
is understanding that Jesus is the one God trusted to oversee, to guard and secure and carry out the relationship between God and man, which is established and secured in our confession, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. See, what, what John chapter 3 verse 17 and following goes into it goes into this reality that Jesus Christ was not sent into the world as a judge. God didn't send Jesus to come and to condemn us. Why? Because it's unnecessary. Note to self, ladies, I need you to know something to me. Okay, Christy, plug your ears for just a second. You're not my wife. None of you are shocked, are you? Okay, Christy, that did not apply to you. We're good. Right. Now, did it surprise you that you're not my wife, ladies? Are you feeling judged? Some of you are like, hallelujah, no, I am not, Pastor. No, no, no. The distance in our relationship, the reality that you are not my bride, right, makes it obvious it's not, it doesn't take me to tell you that. It doesn't come make me come in and, and to judge you. Ladies, you're not thinking here today, oh, am I unworthy to be your wife? What's wrong with polygamy? There's a lot if you're at home, right? Jesus, the Lord says, I did not send Jesus into the world to condemn it. Why? Because they're already living in adultery. You have given your heart to a deity, a groom, that is not the right relationship. So I sent my son into the world, not for condemnation. It's already there. There's no judgment. Christ did not come with a baseball bat. He came with a hand to rescue you and I from the fiery grave that we deserve because we are out of relationship with him. Consider Jesus, the high priest of this confession, that God so loved the world that he sent his son as an apostle. He dispatched him as the messenger and the message and the method of good news. It was his son, Jesus. That whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But don't get it wrong, he's not just the apostle. He's the high priest. Because God did not send his son into the world to condemn it but to save it. Because only the high priest of God, who is in charge of a relationship between God and man, who is in charge of giving you and I an understanding of what his covenant is, and who is in charge of overseeing the depth of that covenant, can do that. That is why the priests of the Old Testament were not enough. That is why this is not the Passover. It's the Lord's Supper. Because Jesus did what an imperfect man could not do. He established a relationship with God and man. And by his life, his grace, his death, and his resurrection, he oversees the, the establishment of that relationship. And it cannot be taken away. It cannot be challenged. It cannot be removed because it is no longer a man guarding it, but the risen Savior, the Son of God, the apostle and the high priest of our confession. He's not just a baby, amen? Consider Jesus. Now check this. As we get ready to take the Lord's Supper, the response of Scripture is consider Him. For some of you, you in this room, you've just heard about Jesus, the apostle and the high priest, but it's never been of your confession. And today God has changed your world. Because what you thought you understood, board stretching, you now understand it's something different. And maybe this moment God is telling you, I sent my son Jesus. I dispatched him to you. As the message and the method of which my apostle, my son, who is high priest, can bring you into right relationship with me. 
And because he is my son and because he is able, he will be in charge of overseeing that covenant no matter what tomorrow holds. And today, you need to confess Jesus. But there are others in this room to where you know Jesus and you have confessed him. As we prepare the Lord's Supper, you need to consider Jesus. Consider what it means for him, sourced in God's love, to have come here for you. And the joy that awaits, the unspeakable joy what he deserves and what he shared. So the invitation this morning is just to prepare our hearts to consider Jesus as we take the Lord's Supper. For just a moment, would you stand with me as we pray? Father God, Lord, we love you this morning. Lord, I ask this morning, Lord, that we would consider Jesus, the apostle and the high priest of my confession and the confession of all those who I count as brothers and sisters in Christ. God, but I pray that it wouldn't stop there. Lord, I pray that your kingdom would know no ends. And there would not be a single person in here, Lord, who is outside of that relationship, who leaves outside of that relationship. Because you didn't send your son to the world to judge it. We've done that enough. I know I'm the most guilty person in the room but you sent him to save us. In Jesus' name, amen.